If you get yourself insulin sensitive, you will get leaner. You will get more fit. You will burn fat. If you're insulin resistant, the opposite is going to happen. Now I'm going to explain what this means and I'm going to make it very simple. But the entire purpose of this video is to give you ways to improve your insulin sensitivity, specifically via timing of food, but also specific foods you can eat. So it's going to make it so that your insulin levels aren't high all the time. Quick news flash, if your insulin levels are high, it prevents your body from burning fat. Hey, I wanna make sure you go ahead and hit that red subscribe button and then hit that little bell icon to turn on notifications so you never ever miss a beat. And also check out Thrive Market down in the description, okay? So I've been able to create grocery boxes specifically for low carb diets, for fasting, things like that, because Thrive is an online grocery market. So you don't have to go to the grocery store, you just get stuff delivered right to your doorstep. And I've been able to create these really cool bundles and boxes People always watch my grocery videos, but this just makes it easy. This way you're like, this is what Thomas would recommend I get on keto, make it simple, wham, bam, done. So go ahead and click on that link after you watch this video and check it out. All right, let's go ahead and let's talk about insulin and the foods that you can start eating to reduce your insulin resistance and improve your insulin sensitivity. All right, so first off, we have to look at a study. A study that was published in the journal of Diabetes Care. Okay, this study took a look at 14 diabetic patients. It's really, really interesting. And this just shows the magnitude of insulin when it comes down to how fast we gain fat. 14 diabetic patients, they gave them insulin until their blood sugar was normal. So they said, okay, we're just gonna keep on giving you insulin until your blood sugars are normal. They did this for six months, which means that they had to gradually increase the amount of insulin they gave them, okay? So as they would give them insulin, they'd get more insulin resistant, they'd have to give them more insulin. The point is, at the end of six months, they were giving them 100 units of insulin just to keep their blood sugar normalized. Well, guess what they found out? At the end of six months, they ended up on average gaining 19 pounds. 19 pounds. 19 pounds in six months? What the heck? Okay, that simply came also with 300 calories less than when they started. So yes, they ate 300 calories less but gained 19 pounds. What's happening here? Well, the whole premise of this is to show that insulin made it so that they gained fat. They gained 19 pounds, even though they were eating less, simply because they had to keep increasing their insulin levels, okay? Now, there's also new science that shows that high levels of insulin break down our blood-brain barrier and make it so that things get into our brain. And anyway, I don't wanna just waste your time with this. Let's get to the stuff that you want to hear. Now you know insulin is important and you need to be insulin sensitive. You need to make it so your cells always want insulin, not rejecting it. The first thing, the order of your food, okay? Simply by eating your proteins and your veggies a little bit before your carbohydrates, you end up lowering your overall insulin need dramatically, causing more insulin sensitivity. Also published in the Journal of Diabetes Care was a study that found this, okay? They had subjects eat their protein and veggies 15 minutes before their carbs, and then another group, they had consumed their carbs and then their protein and veggies. Well, then they measured their overall blood sugar and insulin at 30, 60, and 120 minutes after eating. Want to know the results? Well, 29% at 30 minutes, 37% at 60 minutes, and 17% lower at 120 minutes. So what that means is for those time periods afterwards, they were that much lower on blood sugar and insulin simply by having their protein a little bit before, 15 minutes before their carbs. That's literally you sitting down at a restaurant and opting to eat your protein and veggies first on your plate and then circling around to your carbohydrates. By the time you're talking with friends and family and everything like that, you can kill 15 minutes before you eat those carbohydrates and you end up with 37% lower insulin levels. So you end up with more insulin sensitivity. It's funny because when I'm talking about the order of food, if any of you watch my intermittent fasting videos, I always suggest having a small amount of protein first and then 30, 60 minutes later, have a larger meal. It's for this reason, so we don't get this just voluptuous insulin spike. We can control it. Break a fast, have your protein, wait a little bit, then have your other foods. It's simply going to make it so your blood sugar doesn't skyrocket as much. Okay, now let's talk about the things that you can add into the diet all the time. Okay, ginger, add it all the time. Eat it with breakfast, eat it with lunch, put it in your water, make an elixir, I don't care. Sprinkle ginger powder. It's silly not to unless you absolutely despise it. There's something in ginger known as gingerols. What gingerols do is they allow GLUT4 to come to the surface of a cell. So imagine this, here's your cell, okay? And inside that cell you have these things called GLUT4. And these GLUT4 come to the surface to receive and be receptive to insulin and glucose. 
Okay, but imagine for an instance uh, you only have one GLUT4 uh, one GLUT4 piece, right? That's only one opportunity to be able to catch insulin and food. But what if you had more GLUT4 coming to the surface over the entire area of the cell? Well, then you could catch more glucose. You could catch, therefore, reducing your insulin. Well, that's what ginger does, is it increases the ability for your body to absorb more glucose, therefore, driving your glucose levels down and keeping your insulin levels down and nice and uh, insulin sensitive. Okay, the other piece, and you can mix this with ginger or you can have it separately, is don't be shy with cinnamon. Cinnamon is one of the most powerful things that is totally underrated. Okay, it's high in what is called methyl hydroxychalcone polymer. And this methyl hydroxychalcone polymer mimics insulin. So it's like an artificial insulin that triggers the cell to be receptive to glucose so you don't need to elevate insulin, thereby making you more insulin sensitive. That's like a magical thing. But then the cool thing is it also happens to work in tandem with insulin. So what that means is not only does it mimic insulin and keep your insulin levels low, but if there is insulin in the bloodstream, it makes that insulin more effective. All of these are tools to make it so that your cells can get by with less insulin. Now, to make batters even better, it's cool that cinnamon also binds to the uh, specific part of your brain called the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, which is just an area of your brain that just makes you more satiated, so that's a plus. Next one, magnesium. So eat foods that are high in magnesium, but honestly, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. I would love to tell you to eat you know, 76 almonds per day to get your daily recommended amount of good quality magnesium, but I'm just gonna call a spade a spade. It's easier to just take a good quality magnesium supplement. Okay, I would recommend between four and 800 milligrams of a good quality dimagnesium malate. I'm happy to link down below to one that I would recommend. The point is, is magnesium also increases the amount of GLUT4, so it also increases, again, you know, the amount of sugar, the amount of insulin that a cell could be receptive to but it also regulates the insulin signaling pathway. Okay, so it, rather than having an indirect route, magnesium makes it so the insulin signaling can be very direct. So basically, it can just help the body understand that insulin's on its way and everything can work efficiently. We need magnesium for thousands and thousands of different enzymatic functions in the body. This is just one of the pivotal ones when it comes down to your waistline. Okay, now the big one. High amounts, and I mean high amounts, of omega-3. Okay, I don't care if you're eating good quality fish, I don't care if you're eating grass-fed, grass-finished meat, or I don't care if you're taking copious amounts of high, high quality fish oil supplements. Omega-3s do something unique, okay? What they do is they alter the beta cells that are in our pancreas. In our pancreas, we have these beta cells that produce insulin. Well, those beta cells, just like anything in life, if they don't just get active and get moving, they get kind of stale. Well, omega-3s end up going directly to the phospholipid membrane of those cells. What that means is these cells in our pancreas now become much more fluid, and they have the ability to migrate, move, and communicate with each other, which therefore increases their ability to properly produce insulin and not become sort of just deficient at producing it. When someone is diabetic, their beta cells have a hard time producing insulin because they're producing so much. So imagine if your pancreas could produce just enough insulin with one little pump because the cells are operating better. Another thing that obviously is going to go without saying, and it's silly for me to even mention it, that is the fact that if you increase your soluble fiber intake, it is going to lower your overall insulin resistance. Okay, like. I know it's obvious, but let's just call it what it is. There are so many studies that have shown that if you increase your soluble fiber intake, that you end up reducing the amount of sugar that's actually absorbed. So if you are by chance doing keto or a low carb diet, a little bit of chia or a little bit of flax goes a long way. Okay, you get, you know, a tablespoon of flax is gonna not kick you out of keto. A half a tablespoon of chia seeds is not gonna kick you out of keto. But once it combines with water in your gut, it swells up to the extent of being like 30 grams of fiber. I mean, it's powerful stuff. So therefore, you get all the benefit of reducing your blood sugar, keeping things low, keeping your insulin sensitivity nice and high, but without potentially kicking you out of keto. But of course, you also get the fiber effect too that's going to help you out in a lot of different ways. So I know that one's basic and I didn't wanna lead with it for that reason. But if you combine all of these, change up the order of your food, change up by adding some ginger, add some cinnamon into the mix, add the omega-3s, take a magnesium supplement, and then of course add some fiber into the mix. You do this for a year, your insulin sensitivity is going to be so different than what it was before. So anyhow, as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you in the next video.